Uh, okay, let's uh, talk about Bible prophecy. Uh, very heavy week, obviously. Uh, I'm going to talk about the events of this last week for what I would uh, see, see as being deemed obvious reasons. Um, personally, I'm struck by how swiftly and severely uh, everything that is taking place uh, is taking place, and really the timing in which what has happened has happened. I mean, to say that it's been a busy week on the calendar of Bible prophecy would, I think, be a tremendous understatement, to say the least. Uh, so much is happening so fast. We woke up on Monday to the situation in Syria quickly deteriorating. Uh, the breaking news later in the week was that Asma, which is Bashar al-Assad's wife, had fled to Russia, and that also Bashar al-Assad himself was in hiding. Uh, the assumption is that if the situation continues to deteriorate, and it most certainly will, that he will too, uh, to save his own life, flee to Russia as well. Uh, that was just basically Monday, then only to hear on Wednesday of this, uh, interestingly in terms of its timing, the bombing of an Israeli tour bus uh, in, of all places, Bulgaria. Uh, the reason I mention the timing is because it was uh, several years to the day of another terrorist attack on Jews. Uh, I don't have the time to really get into all of the dynamics uh, concerning that, but suffice it to say that when we got home Thursday night after our midweek Bible study, we were uh, met with the horrific and catastrophic news of this mass murder. Uh, I must say that this demon-possessed man, for whom I will never utter his name, nor show his picture, lest he obtain any notoriety for his satanic acts. I believe that he raised the bar in terms of evil. This is unspeakable. It's unthinkable. Now, there are those who say that this had to be staged, and they offer really a compelling, I think, argument, though they're seen as being from the uh, conspiracy bent, if you will. Um, they have actually connected the dots between all of the happenings of just this last week, and in so doing, paint a bigger picture, a greater conspiracy, even with respect to the upcoming uh, opening ceremony in London for the 2012 Olympics. Uh, there are those who would uh, subscribe to that. I don't know about that. Uh, but what I do know is that there are others who say that this is more about controls. Um, I don't know about that either. But what I do know is that the Bible says it's all about the souls. Think about this. The reality is that at least 12 people stepped into eternity shortly after midnight on that truly dark night, and they left behind many grieving hearts. The amount of grief is matched only by the amount of unanswered questions as to how it is that something so evil as this could happen like this. You'll forgive me for my, um, my belief with respect to the field of psychiatry, 
but I just about can't watch another news broadcast where they're asking the expert psychiatrist or psychologist for some kind of an answer. Excuse me, they don't have the answer. Uh, the only answer is found in the person of Jesus Christ. It seems that the Apostle Paul's prophecy in writing to Timothy concerning the last days now rings true more than ever given this satanic event. It's in his second epistle, Second Timothy, you can certainly turn there if you wish. It's the third chapter, and I'll just read the first four verses, that's enough. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is going to describe for this young pastor by the name of Timothy what the last days will look like, how bad it's going to get at the time of the end. And he describes in listing all of these things this description of what will mark the last days, what will be the characteristics of the last days. He says, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Some of your translations will render it perilous times. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You know, in a prior prophecy update, we've looked at each one of these on this list individually and in depth. And it's really quite a list, and I would suggest to you that it describes that which we are seeing before our very eyes in the world today. This is that day. This is not only the last days, it's the last day. Now, one needs to step back from the prophetic tree, especially given the kind of week that we just had. Uh, the reason being is that seeing the forest can come into clear focus, if you please. Globally and geopolitically, everything fits with the timing on the clock of Bible prophecy. And by that, I mean that there's this common denominator of sorts in how everything fits together and in how quickly everything is happening together. Whether it's Bulgaria, Syria, or America, there is a connecting of these events and it would seem that this clock of Bible prophecy is ticking faster and faster with each passing hour. What's interesting to me is how that the commentators, and there are many, uh, they're all saying essentially the same thing, such that the evil that we are now witnessing is the likes of which we have never seen before. The swiftness with which everything is happening is the likes of which we have never seen before. One such commentary related primarily to the seriousness of Syria was from John McTurnan, whom I thought said it best when he wrote, quote, so many critical events are happening so fast I literally cannot keep up with it now. I feel his pain. <laughs> uh, just this last week, I uh, usually I start on the prophecy update on Sunday night, try to at least get the wheels in motion. Uh, Monday morning, I 
get into the office early, sometimes really early, depending on what's on my calendar. And I always, you know, go to the throne and petition the Lord and, you know, petition the, and inquire of the Lord. And I find myself, especially this last week, I get started on the update. And then usually by about Thursday, I get a pretty good idea where we're going to go with the update. But this week I was updating the update Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, updated it Thursday, updated it Friday. Then I had to update it Saturday. And then I get up at 4 a.m. on Sunday mornings to update it again. This is the fruit of that, I guess you might say. Well, he goes on to say, the God of Israel is applying Obadiah 1.15 to Assad of Syria, which says, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done to Israel, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. It appears that the Syrian government is not going to last. The rebels are within Damascus, and Assad cannot stop them. Some of Assad's top generals and diplomats have defected. There are vast amounts of chemical and biological weapons along with missiles at stake. Israel cannot let them fall into the hands of Hezbollah or the Muslim Brotherhood. Assad is losing grip and has but days to decide whether to attack Israel. Israel may attack the weapons of mass destruction locations to destroy them. Iran and Russia might intervene in an attempt to save Assad. Anything at all could trigger this coming all-out war. The bottom line to all this is that Damascus and Syria do not have long to live. The prophet Isaiah is clear that prior to the day of the Lord, Damascus will be obliterated along with Syria. They will become part of a greater Israel. I'll take it a step further and suggest that this will usher in the prophecy that we have recorded in Ezekiel 38. Again, Isaiah 17, which is the prophecy concerning Damascus becoming a ruinous heap, a pile of rubble, I believe will likely, more likely than not, be fulfilled prior to the other prophecies, one of which is not only Psalms 83, but also the prophecy in Ezekiel 38, enter Russia and Iran, which by the way is what all of this is about. There are those, uh, and in all fairness to their uh, commentary, they believe that this bombing in Bulgaria is a way to get this whole situation with Iran, they're sort of egging Israel on. They want there to be this attack, which would then give them license to go in and attempt, they won't succeed, but attempt to destroy Israel. Again, this is what I mean by the stepping back from the tree, as it were, in order to see the greater forest of Bible prophecy. Well, I suppose you could say that prophetic events geopolitically are heating up and revving up. Uh, this shouldn't really come as any surprise to those of us who know the Word of God, namely the prophetic Word of God, those prophecies in the Word of God that Jesus in John 14, 29 said, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens, you'll believe. I'm going to tell you about what's going to happen in Syria before it happens in Syria, so when it happens in Syria, you'll believe. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in Aurora, Colorado before it happens, so that when it happens, you'll believe. Well. The scriptures are clear in a plethora of places, not the least of which are the words in God's word from Jesus himself when he speaks of his soon return. There's this one verse in Revelation 22 that I just 
can't get over. It's actually one of my favorite Revelation verses. I know I say that about all the verses and all of the chapters in the book of Revelation, but this particular one is most intriguing because of the original translation of the Greek New Testament. If you wish, you can turn there as I can even hear now some of you are doing. It's Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. Let me read it out of the King James Version. Jesus is speaking and says, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. It's this word quickly that I wish to draw your attention to. It's translated from the original language, taku, that's the Greek word. Now, before you respond with gesundheit, let me explain what, what taku means. It carries with it the idea of being suddenly. It's an interesting word. And it is where we get our word for the tachometers that we have in our cars. What are tachometers? Uh, for the benefit of the ladies who uh, may not be mechanically or, you know, I know that's a guy thing maybe, but uh, tachometers, it's not the speedometer, that's different. Uh, tachometers gauge the revolutions per minute of the engine, of the motor. The acronym is the RPMs, revolutions per minute, so as to know whether or not the engine is reaching what they call the red line, typically about 6,000 RPMs. Now, interesting with RPMs, uh, it, the time is set. It's revolutions per minute. The minute is a set measurement of time and the measurement is to gauge the amount of revolutions in that set time. Now, isn't it interesting that Jesus would use this word? I say that to share this. Jesus is describing a world that is revved up, if you please, to the point of reaching that red line. The time is set. No man knows that time, the day, the hour, but the time is set. And those revolutions will continue to increase and be revved up, reaching the red line. I've never seen myself as being the brightest bulb in the pack, but I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that this is indeed what we see coming to pass. It wasn't that long ago that a very well-respected prophecy teacher, Dr. Thomas Ice, made the statement that I think was uh, well said, a word fitly spoken. He said, you know, it's like somebody pressed the fast forward button on Bible prophecy. And to me, you cannot push pause. It's too late. We've passed that point of no return so much so that I'm of the belief that we're a click of the mouse away from all hell literally breaking loose, particularly in the Middle East. And if it does, it's not a matter of if, really when, when it does, it will in turn fulfill major prophecies and they will come suddenly quickly, instantly, really. Now stay with me as I list a number of events that hit the front pages of our daily newspapers and found their place at the top of our uh, daily news feeds. This was Monday, July 16th. The Telegraph, Hague. The situation in Syria is deteriorating alarmingly. Yahoo! Damascus fighting rages in what may be turning point. Interesting choice of words. 
Tuesday, July 17th, Debka. South Damascus embattled, Syrian high command moves to fortified site. Yahoo. Assad will use chemical weapons, top defector. Yahoo. Syria fighting rages in capital, speaking of Damascus. Russia pressed. Wednesday, July 18th, the Telegraph. U.S. Syria is, notice the word, rapidly, quickly spinning out of control. Yahoo. Pentagon. 20 nations plan exercise in Middle East. Why? They're posturing themselves, readying themselves, steadying themselves for what would be the uh, foregone conclusion of a war in the Middle East. Thursday, July 19th, Yahoo! Jordan King warns on Al-Qaeda chemical weapons. Jerusalem Post, U.S. Israel discuss destroying Syrian weapons. The Times of Israel, Netanyahu, Hezbollah directed by Iran carried out Bulgaria terror attack. I don't know how else to say it, but this is exactly, nay, even precisely what the Bible says will happen just prior to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Here's what I'm thinking. What we are witnessing right before our very eyes is this unstoppable momentum that's gone past the point of no return. And maybe a better way to say it is that Bible prophecy has revved up so fast that it's now redlined. And it's to the point where it could all just blow up. When you, for a certain amount of time, rev up your engine on your car past the red line, you'll blow that motor. To use that analogy, this is exactly what I believe we are seeing and what makes it so remarkable, even astonishing, is that just in the span of only one week, the world is, to quote the Telegraph headline we just read, rapidly, quickly, suddenly spinning out of control. The world is coming apart. Consider this graphic of a meter. Uh, I have to tell you, though, I totally stole it from another pastor. <laughs> I had his permission, actually. Uh, he shared it with uh, all the other pastors that are on this uh, list server that I'm on. But uh, also, I tweaked it quite a bit for the purpose of our prophecy update today. But uh, it's really by way of putting things into proper perspective. Now, think through this with me. Uh, from July of 2011 to today, July of 2012. Now, for those of you who have a good memory, I don't. Uh, but if you have a good memory, uh, do you remember what was going on back in July of uh, 2011? There was another mass murder. And it was this white, supposedly Christian and he killed, I don't know how many people. That was about one year ago today. Now, I say that to say that just in the last one year, from July of 2011 to July of 2012, we have seen what I believe are the makings, all of the necessary ingredients in the recipe for the rapture happening at any time. Now, I can tell by the way you're looking at me that it seems like I keep saying that the rapture can happen every week. And that's because I keep saying that the rapture can happen every week. I'm not trying to be cute. 
But the reason I keep saying that the rapture can happen at any time is because the rapture can happen at any time. I mean, just logically, practically, we are this week, one week closer to the rapture. I know that's deeply profound, but think about it. Do the math. We are one day closer to the rapture today. And by the way, the rapture could be today. I'm going to close with 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, actually, I'm kind of setting the stage, Lord willing, for what uh, may be next week uh, a uh, more in-depth look at this particular prophecy, because there's so much here in what the Apostle Peter records. Uh, it's in his second epistle and the third chapter, and I'll read from verses 10 through 14. You might in your own uh, time, your own devotions, uh, in God's Word. Uh, you may want to read the entire uh, epistle. It's not very long. You can read it in one sitting, but particularly uh, drawing your attention to this third chapter in the second epistle. Listen to what he says. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Verse 11, listen. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Wow. He's going to answer it, kind of help us out. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming, what does that mean? Well, you're going to have to come back next week. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> that day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. This to me is the clarion call, and it needs to be shouted from every rooftop in every home all over the world, and it needs to be shouted from every pulpit in every church all over the world. The hope that we have creates this desire within us to purify ourselves, to get our affairs in order, to live holy lives, to live godly lives. Listen, there's no time to play around. There's no time to play at this faith we call our Christianity. There is certainly no more time to play church. The time is at hand. Have there been things in your life that have been given permission to take up residence in your life that don't belong there? These are hindrances. These are besetting sins. These are things that make you dirty, unholy, unclean. And thus, when He comes, you won't be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him. I want to encourage you, if you're here this morning, first and foremost, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you today need to make Him your Lord and Savior. There's no more time. The stakes are too high. They're eternally high. Don't mess around. Don't play around. Don't take that chance. 
Today is the day of your salvation. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If you're here this morning, you're a believer. You've been walking with the Lord. You've even been coming to this church for an elongated period of time. By the way, if you have, you have treasures in heaven, just so you know, because... Anyways, (laughs) Anyways, <laughs> if for no other reason other than you, you know, had to sit on those hard pews for so long as the pastor kept going and going and going. And just when you thought he was done, uh, then you had sermon number two, you know, because after the prophecy update. So basically you get two sermons for the price of one. But anyway, I'm just, just saying Maybe wanted to lighten it up a little bit, maybe. But seriously, if you're here this morning, you're a believer. But if the truth be known, and God sees your heart, you don't have that excitement. You lack that urgency. And the result of that has been that these things have crept into your Christian experience. Things that have kept you from Him and the looking for Him. Things that maybe have you too bound to this earth, the things of this world. They're the things that you have, no problem, but the problem is those things have you. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a material possession. You fill in the blanks. What is it that is keeping you from being blameless, not the same as sinless, blameless, righteous, holy, whole? Well, pastor, how do you be holy? I know that we're to be holy. We're told in the pages of Holy Writ, but we're to be holy as He is holy. But how? It comes vis-a-vis the Holy Spirit. There's no way, absent the power of the Holy Spirit, that you and I with you can live a holy life. It's the how of the Holy Spirit that empowers us and enables us to live that holy life. The how of the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the what of His holy word. Now, maybe you're here this morning and you've all your life been taught that, well, when I came to Christ and was born again, the Holy Spirit indwelt me and that's all I needed. Well, I'm going to ask you to just consider and be a Berean and and search the scriptures and see what if I'm, I'm about to tell you is true or not. There is this work of the Holy Spirit, this baptism of the Holy Spirit, It's when the Holy Spirit not just indwells you, but comes upon you and fills you to overflowing so that your life becomes powerful as torrents of living water. If you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit, you are to be pitied. I say that in love because that means that you're trying to live a holy life in the energy and the power of your own flesh. It can only be done in the Spirit and by the Spirit and in that power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. I'll say lastly that if we have any hope of being victorious, being holy, being blameless, righteous in these last days, we have to have the Holy Spirit if we're going to survive, I use that word carefully, and even thrive. There's no way that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are going to be able to make it should the Lord tarry in the days ahead. Because on the authority of God's word, What lies ahead will wax more evil by the hour. 
and has the propensity to make that which we've witnessed in this last week seem like kindergarten. Pastor, you're scaring me now. Good. Good. Remember, I would much rather scare you into heaven than flatter you into hell. As long as the Lord gives me breath and allows me the awesome privilege of being the pastor of this amazing and loving and wonderful church, I will never not tell you the whole truth, so help me God, and nothing but the truth. In love, of course, because of love, of course. I hope that you'll allow the Holy Spirit unfettered access to your heart this morning, that he would be allowed to do that much needed work in your heart, in your life. Maybe allow him to just ever so gently, just put his finger on that one area in your life. And you know what it is, because heretofore you've been blowing him off. You've been shining him on. Yeah, I know, Lord. I know, I know, I know. The Lord says, no, that's got to go. That's got to go. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. I pray that we would not be like the multitudes who, because of the hard teaching, left, never to return. Lord, I pray that in a way we would be more like Peter who would say, when asked by the Lord, are you too going to leave because of the hard teaching? Lord, like Peter, where else are we going to go? You alone have the words of life. Lord, please, will you allow this as hard, as tough as the stuff is to chew on and swallow and assimilate? Lord, we know that this is life. Thank you. Lord, for anyone here in this church today who doesn't know you, in a saving way, will you make today the day of their salvation. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.